The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Pizdek, and I want to welcome you to our webinar. Uh, today we're going to hear from a Pizdek Institute uh, certified Lean Six Sigma black belt, Steve Zaprina, and he's going to tell us about individuals and moving range charts. He's going to show us a uh, method for doing the calculations that's a manual method, and uh, I really think that's a good way to teach people. They can see what you're doing and understand the calculations. So it's a good teaching tool. Uh, afterwards, I'm going to give you a, uh, a real brief overview of an automated tool that will automate the calculations. Uh, and later on, after the webinar, you'll receive a, an email that will have links to the recording. Uh, it'll have a link to the tools that you're going to see here today, and it will also um, have a link to the PDF files of the uh, slides that Steve's going to show. So uh, with no further ado, I want to welcome you all to the <coughs> webinar, and I'm going to turn uh, control over to Steve. Steve, you're on the air. Okay. Um, thanks, Tom, and uh, thanks very much for the invitation to do the webinar, and uh, many thanks to uh, all the attendees for, uh, for sitting in. As Tom said, the, uh, the webinar, the title is How to Create, Understand, Use, and Teach IMR charts, uh, with the emphasis on, on teaching, to go through um, an example of a method that I've used in the past to teach folks um, how to use these charts with the hope that uh, it will be useful to everyone. So um, I've got a slide here with the agenda, brief agenda. Uh, we'll start with an overview of process behavior charts, and then talk a little bit about terminology. Uh, I've found in the past that sometimes terminology can be confusing to people, and that's a important point to, uh, to think about. And uh, we'll speak briefly about uh, separating signal from noise, a very important point. In fact, that's really what we're trying to do here, is to come up with an easy, reliable way to separate uh, signal from noise. And then we'll uh, spend the bulk of the time on actually doing uh, a manual execution of an IMR chart using some forms that I've prepared, which have been made, uh, used, made available to everyone. And uh, then I'll try to um, show everyone how to create IMR charts in Minitab. I have Minitab 17. I hope that's uh, useful to everyone. And then a, a brief discussion towards the end on whether we should use software or pencil and paper for given situations. And uh, depending on what you're doing and what you're trying to accomplish, sometimes software is better, sometimes pencil, pencil and paper um, is better. And I'll uh, explain why I say that. And then we'll talk um, about annotating charts, a really interesting um, sort of follow-on to creating the chart. And then at the very end, we'll wrap up with uh, talk about pitfalls to avoid. And uh, folks, I can guarantee you if there's a pitfall uh, in any of these charts, I have found them, and they've hit me on the head, and, um, and they've done some damage. So I'm an expert on, uh, on pitfalls. I've learned uh, uh, the hard way. So, so the, the, the purpose of all of this, all of the above, is to um, is to present some experience for people to consider. Uh, you might find it useful in your own uh, in your own work, your own studies. And my only goal here is to try to help people and to help you help your employer or help you find an employer if that's what uh, what you're doing. And um, so we'll now start on a brief overview of process behavior charts. And um, there are quite a few of them. Um, I'll just read a, a few individual moving range charts, which we'll talk about today. And then there's the average range chart, some people call the X bar R control chart. Uh, there's control charts for attributes, um, short runs, and Tom Pizdek's book, the Six Sigma Handbook, covers all of those uh, in detail. So there are, there are many different types, and today we're only going to speak about um, one of them. And it's the IMR chart. Um, some people call it the Swiss Army knife of, of IMR charts or control charts. Uh, people call it the MacGyver of control charts. It's a, it's a multi-purpose tool. And although the uh, X bar R uh, chart um, is generally more sensitive uh, to process change, um, sometimes that's not practical, and the use of the IMR chart is, um, is a default. It's uh, the only tool we have available to you. But as a default, it serves uh, extremely well in my experience. And the purpose for um, process behavior charts overall is to um, is to do a number of things. First thing is to is to visualize data. Um, I'm at the point now every time I see an Excel spreadsheet with rows and columns, uh, I start getting a headache. And uh, 
And the first thing I want to do is try to visualize it well. An IMR chart, very simple, very effective way to visualize data. And um, process uh, behavior charts uh, also um, serve the purpose of helping us hear the voice of our process. Our process speaks to us in many, many forms. Temperature, pressure, geometry, etc. Any of that data that we collect from our process um, is a voice that, it, that that's trying to speak to us. And the process behavior chart, in any of its forms, helps us hear the voice of the process. And it tells us, is our process stable? Is it unstable? Has it shifted? So uh, very useful uh, purpose, and, um, and, and, and in the case where people are trying to improve processes, it's, it's really vital that you understand what your process is capable of. And uh, as I said earlier, um, process behavior charts help us separate signal from noise. And the best news of all is that uh, the IMR chart is, um, is really simple, and it's really effective. And the only thing that you have to do to learn is to is to practice a bit. So I hope to get those that are unfamiliar with IMR charts practicing today. And for those who are familiar with it, maybe you'll pick up some tips on, on how to teach. So, um, so that's the overview. And um, we'll now talk a little bit about uh, terminology. Um, I use the term noise and signal. Um, some people will use the terms common cause variation random noise, expected variation, all of those are equivalent terms. When teaching, um, normally the briefer the description, the better, so noise and signal, um, very simple terms. Once people understand them, it's easier to speak about noise rather than common cause variation to someone, for example, who's not a Six Sigma green belt or a black belt. And then the term signal, conversely, is um, the unexpected variation in our process. Um, some, ter some terminology, special cause, assignable cause, variation. Those are, those are signals. Those are the things we're looking for. And those things can be good for our process, bad for our process, can be a mistake. It's, uh, it's the process telling us, hey, there's something going on here. Um, we should look. And uh, even the term IMR sometimes <laughs> creates some confusion. I use IMR because that's, that's what the Minitab default is. If you go to Minitab, it calls it an IMR chart, the XMR chart used by uh, John Pysdick, I believe, and Donald Weaver's books all talk about XMR. Uh, some software refers to them as IR charts. All the same, I uh, use whatever term is uh, least confusing. And uh, again, I'll use the term IMR chart for the presentation. Now, um, something from my experience to ponder uh, regarding terminology. Um, again, I've made many, many mistakes, and uh, I've learned from them. So just to pass along some of that insight, um, the term control charts is, is best avoided at first, um, maybe uh, permanently in some organizations, and use instead the term process behavior chart, because the chart isn't really controlling anything outside of a few exceptions. You're, you're really trying to understand what the, how the process is behaving, not to try to control the chart, or to control the process, excuse me. So, so I found good luck, uh, had good luck with the use of the term process behavior chart. I believe it's clearer. Uh, SPC, uh, some people, especially if you use the term statistical process control, some folks will run out of the room uh, screaming and uh, never to be seen again. So um, SPC um, term best avoided. And you can use the term process behavior study. You want to study the process, see how it behaves, and see what the process is telling us. Um, that's a clearer message for most people than the use of the term statistical process control. Uh, even the term control limits, I use the term upper expected limit, lower expected limit, as we'll see later on. Uh, the term statistics also conjures up some bad uh, memories for some people. I use the term data analysis. Uh, the term mean can see, can, uh, confuses some people, and uh, average seems to be the better term. More, more people will understand that. So again, some terms uh, that you might want to avoid at first when you're first teaching people. And um, you know, sometimes you have to make light of all of this. Yeah, statistics can sometimes be dry, and people remember their, you know, business statistics course from uh, from college, and uh, again they'll go screaming and running out of the room. So uh, sometimes we, we we make some fun of it, and uh, we say, well, if you've uh, abandoned hope, you can uh, disregard the message. So um, right, that's it on terminology. I'm going to now talk a little bit about the vital task of separating signal from noise. And, um, and why it's important? Well, it's important because it's rampant. There is, um, 
there is confusion between signal and noise all around us, I believe. We've all heard um, phrases like, the inventory is the highest it's been in six months. Um, scrap is up from last week. These, um, this is an unfortunate human tendency to sort of assign meaning to each new point and make a limited comparison. Um, the media reinforces that um, that, uh, that tendency as well, you know, car sales up 10% from the same week of last year, uh, unemployment rate down 1.2% from last week, all limited comparisons, and in many cases, what people are talking about is, is noise rather than true signals. We believe that if car sales are up 10% from the same week last year, that that is a signal that something has changed, and that's not necessarily true. In totality, it costs um, companies a lot of money. So again, I believe it's important to separate signal from noise using control charts or cost of behavior charts. And, and the end game is you, you save your employer time, money, and uh, contribute to the bottom line. And uh, who can argue with that? So um, take a quote from Tom's book, uh, variation from common causes, noise, should be left to chance, but special causes, signals, should be identified and eliminated. Um, if folks um, in business followed that one simple, outstanding bit of advice, um, companies would be, in fact, I believe, far more profitable and people would be under far less stress. They wouldn't be worried about the inventory being the highest it's been in six months uh, when, in fact, um, it may be uh, just random noise that's, uh, that's caused that. Um, again, Quotes sometimes uh, provide insight. Nate Silver, famous uh, author of the book, The Signal and the Noise, he says it very nicely. Uh, the signal is the truth, and the noise is what distracts us from the truth. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with him more. So, again, separating signal from noise is important. Um, chaos and confusion reigns all around us, and um, the IMR chart helps us make sense of it. So now I'm going to spend most of the time on the construction and teaching the construction of manual IMR charts. So here's the bill of materials that uh, people will need. Um, there's a form. There are some standard forms that have been around for decades um, that some people use. Um, I, I have a form that I'm willing to share with anyone. I've created it in Excel. Um, I put the MR, uh, the moving range part, on the top rather than on the bottom like the pre-printed forms. And I do that for, for, for a good reason, I'll explain later. And, um, and that form's available to anybody that wants to use it. And, and the nice thing is it's in Excel, you can change it if you wish. Uh, you can move things around. If you like that IM, IMR in its normal format, you can, you can rearrange things as you wish. And then some pencils, uh, some colored pencils come in handy when you draw um, average lines and, and, and limits. Color helps people interpret things, so some colored pencils or colored pens are, are useful. Having an eraser, um, especially me, I make lots of mistakes, but I have lots of erasers around. A ruler, a uh, calculator, and uh, most importantly, um, a continuous improvement um, mindset. Um, again, I've made all the mistakes there are to, to be made. Um, I used to use process behavior charts to try to prove a point or a pet theory. Um, that is a horrendous mistake to make. Um, I don't make that mistake anymore. Better is to, t is to look, at, look at this as a way to learn, keep an open mind, and see what the data is telling you. So um, again, a little bit of experience that hopefully um, will be useful to folks. So the teaching method, um, again, another quote from Mark Twain, a person that had took a bull by the tail only once had learned 60 or 70 times as much as a person that hadn't. So I believe that by sitting someone down and having them construct control chart by hand, calculate the limits themselves, see where they come from, punch the calculator, draw the lines, uh, is, a, is an outstanding way to teach, uh, much like grabbing a bull by the tail or picking up a cat by the tail. I think Mark Twain had a saying about that as well. And um, when we talk about any type of control chart, there is, of course, an important prerequisite. Again, a quote right from Tom's book. Uh, rational subgroups are composed of items produced under essentially the same conditions. You have to construct process behavior charts with rational subgroups. To do otherwise um, is, is going to cause trouble. So if you have 
multiple machines, multiple production lines, and you're plotting data from all of them on one chart, you might be getting yourself into some trouble because they're not really produced under the same condition. Much better, of course, on a separate chart for each production line. So here's the form, the, uh, the front of the form in particular. And um, I put the, uh, the uh, moving range chart at the top. Anybody, can anybody see my, my pointer here? Tom, if you can chime in, can you see the... Uh, yeah, we see your pointer. pointer. on my screen? It's right there where we're looking. Okay, yeah. great. Okay, great. I'll, I'll use that then to kind of demonstrate things then. Um, you know, here, here's, here's some name, rank, serial number stuff, what item it is, what interval you're taking data at, what units you're plotting in, who you are started by. And then there's some, some rows and co you know, columns up here for the, for the data itself. Uh, sorry, for, for some more name, rank information, like the date might be here, the time might be here, an operator might be here, and your actual data points here under this row labeled R. Uh, labeled I, sorry. And this is where we calculate moving range, and I'll demonstrate all this momentarily, and then we plot the moving range in this area, and we plot the individual values in this area. And then there's, um, this is one thing you won't find in the pre-printed forms that I find really useful, and I'll talk about it in about annotations. A little bit of space down here for, for some notes. That's the front of the form. The back of the form is, um, is the, where we do the calculations. And um, I think, no, I haven't blown that up for everybody to see. I hope everybody can see it. I hope the, the font is large enough. But it just follows a step-by-step -step pattern, exactly what to do. And I won't uh, elaborate now because we'll, we'll go through that uh, during the actual exercise. So the, the back of the form is for the calculations. And this is where we're going to start the actual exercise. So if, I, if, if all of you folks were, 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 were taking uh, IMR chart 101. This, this is kind of where we would start. So I would give everybody this table of data, and I would ask them to evaluate it. And by the way, this data comes from uh, a book by Donald Wheeler called Understanding Variation. Um, it's actually trade deficit data from the 1980s, I believe, or the 1990s. But it's a great data set because it shows some things, and, it, and, it, and it's, a, it's a great teaching aid. What I've done, though, if you notice here, I've got this labeled man, uh, milligrams, sorry, milligrams of byproduct. I was helping a local company um, that has a, a chemical process, and uh, one of the things that they talk about a lot is milligrams of byproducts. So instead of trade deficits and deficit billions of dollars, the data is in byproducts. It helps them understand it better. And um, so I present the data like this and um, ask them to evaluate it and say, well, what can we, what can we tell by this data? People say, well, we've got this data point here, and we've got a high one at the end. And the whole idea is to get people looking and discussing um, and, and then taking that data and, and actually filling it in the chart, which would be the next step. So if everyone can see, beginning here, we've filled in some data at the top, and we've actually entered uh, the data and some of the times and, and, and date stamps. And I'm just taking this corner here and I'll blow it up for everybody. This is the upper left hand corner. So everybody in the room that, that's, that's, uh, that's constructing the charts themselves sees something like this. And so we, you know, I ask them questions, you know, how do, do, we, do we hear the voice of the process? Are we, are we getting anything out of this? Well, the reality is it's, it's pretty much the same as that table that I've given them. We just kind of rearranged it a little bit. So, so the whole idea is to get people thinking and seeing that you know numbers in tabular form really aren't all that interesting and useful until we do something. And here's the upper right-hand corner, just to, again, put the start date, name, uh, units, etc. And we then move people on to the next step of the exercise, which is to create a scale. We, we have to draw on a scale, in this case from 8 to 18 milligrams. Um, we have to do some calculations of the moving range. Uh, we create the moving range scale from 0 to 5. I ask everyone to plot the individual values, plot the moving ranges, draw on the connecting lines, and then most importantly, discuss what they're seeing. So they will see something like this. And here's a little bit of a, a blown up version of it. 
Here's the same data that we saw earlier, and here are our calculated moving ranges, 1.8 simply being 12.5 minus 10.7, 1.1 being 11.4 minus 12.5, and the absolute value thereof. So we plot 1.8, 1.1, 0.1. Then we take the actual values, the I values, 10.7, plot it down here at the bottom, 12.5, etc. And this is this is where we start getting some really interesting discussions because most people say, ah, the individual values show an increasing trend. So I ask, you know, what should we do? Should we push the panic button? Should we take some action? And some people say, let's let's put in a trend line, a very common practice. So we'll go over to Excel and we'll, we'll do the usual linear regression and, um, and then again we ask the question, should we sound the alarm based on this data? Um, and some people say yes, some people say no, let's wait a while, and some people say yes, this, this is a very clear trend. Um, so I ask everyone to wait. Uh, Steve? One more. Yes, sir. We have a request that you speak a little bit louder. Ah, okay. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to turn up my microphone here a little bit. Okay. Um, will do. Thank you, Tom. So um, we, I ask everyone to wait for, for, for a theoretical one day um, and plot two more points, uh, connect the dots, and, uh, and discuss again. And, and this is what we see. So again, there's this unfolding story that's really very interesting, and I think a lot of people are they see a point here. So we've added only two points, but now the data set really looks rather flat. It doesn't doesn't show that upward trend as it did without the two additional data points. And if we go back to uh, Excel, add the two data points, we see that the uh, linear regression line is in fact um, much flatter. And if we show them side by side. People say, oh my God, we've only added a little bit of data and making a big change. And, 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 the, and the moral of the story is that the point I try to get across is, is, is to really avoid the use of, of, of linear regression to try to, to try to understand data sets. You're sledgehammering the data into a straight line. Um, and sometimes it, sometimes it gives you the right story, sure, um, but many times it does not. So um, try to wean people off of that method and onto something that um, that I believe is better. So now it's time to do some calculations. Uh, lucky us, uh, we calculate I bar, MR bar, and limits. And um, we then look at the back of the form. And I think I've given some in view of this, trying to make it a little bit larger. So here's the, here's the first two steps. So we sum up the individual values. In this case, it's 153. Um, we divide by n, which is 12, and we have um, the I bar of 12.75. And this is an important point that you don't find on the um, on the pre-printed charts. I found very helpful is to is to then notate where where that calculation is coming from. In this case, it's coming from February 1st to February 6th. You can make a mental note of it. We then sum the moving ranges, the calculated values on the on that row labeled MR. We divide by 11. Moving range. You only have 11 of them because you need pairs of data. And um, as it turns out, MR bar is 1.57 again for the noted date. We then take MR bar, multiply it times this constant to calculate the upper expected limit of the moving range. In this case, 5.13. We then take R bar, sorry, I bar, multiply it times the product of MR bar times 2.66, which is 4.18. So we have an upper limit of 16.93. And likewise, for the lower limit, we subtract it out and get a lower limit of 8.57. This is our signal to noise filter, signal versus noise filter, those values. So I ask everyone, draw the, uh, the average values, I bar and MR bar in the green, green line and draw the limits in red. Again, interpret, discuss, debate. So, so this is what they see, and, and things are really starting to get interesting because we have the voice of the process, we have, we have the data points from the process, and we now have an analytical method to, to, to tell us what, 
what we're seeing. Without the analytical method, we can only guess. Yes, there's a high point. Of course, every data set has a high point. There's a low point. Likewise, the calculated values of um, uh, for lower expected limit of the individual value, the upper expected limit of the indiv individual value, and the upper expected limit for the moving range are all very, very valuable, very powerful. And um, I asked people in the class, are we hearing the voice of the process? And most people say yes. Yes, we're taking this data and we're, 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 we're analyzing it. We have some, a method with which to analyze it. Is it stable? Most people will look at this and say, yeah, the process is stable. So, um, lucky us, we now have this analytic method with really nothing more than pencil, paper, and a simple calculator. And um, I then ask people to, to add a little bit more data. Again, this is right out of Donald Wheeler's book because, lo and behold, of course, there's a, there's a signal that we're going to see. So we add the new data, plot, discuss, debate. And um, just a quick reminder, what we're doing here is we're using these limits calculated from a period that we have judged to be generally stable to now evaluate new data points going forward. Very interesting, and that's why I think it's important to annotate you know, my upper and lower limits are based on the data from this particular range of dates. So um, I always emphasize this to folks and, and revisit that with them. And um, when they plot the new, the new data points, lo and behold, um, there is a signal. One of the, the, the points drops below the lower limit for the individual values. So now, now we've got something, and we make the point. It's like, look, folks, up until now, if we took any action based on that linear regression line or gut feel or tribal knowledge, we would have been wasting our time. We would have been chasing noise. Whereas now, um, we haven't made the other mistake, which is to miss a signal where the process is telling us that it, it has, in fact, taken a, taken a, uh, it's shifted, it's taken a change, it's made a change. So we emphasize the point even further, coming down the home stretch on, um, on the manual exercise, uh, adding some more data, connecting the, the dots, discussing, and lo and behold, we see now two very clear signals. And um, what looks to be, if you look very carefully, uh, you compare the data here uh, to the data here, you can see uh, what looks to be a, a shift in the process. And that's what we're looking for. And by the way, I'm sorry, I forgot one important point is to first analyze the um, individual, uh, sorry, to, to analyze the moving range chart to see if there's any out of control points. And if there are, you have to kind of stand down. There may be a problem uh, with the actual calculated limits. But in this case, the uh, MR chart looks fine. Apologies, I should have mentioned that earlier. So having this sanity check in hand, we can now evaluate this data and we see um, something that signals a shift in the process. And in reality, that's really what we want people to see. What we want people to see from this demonstration is that somewhere around that red arrow, the process changed. The process is telling us something. And it's extremely important that we understand that the process has changed. Without the control chart, you might miss it. Say, well, you know, eight's low, but yeah, we had a nine once before, we'll ignore it. Uh, therein lies a danger, and therein lies a phenomenal opportunity to learn something about the process. So again, keep an open mind, listen to what the data is telling us, use the limits as a way to filter signal from noise, prevent chasing noise, prevent missing signals. And um, and then, you know, I've, I've, taught, I've taught this thing uh, dozens of times, and um, every once in a while somebody would say, should we now recalculate the limits? And that's, that's when I go up and high, I high-five the person or I buy the person a coffee or something like that, because that's exactly what we should do. Um, we, we should now uh, recalculate our upper and lower limits based on this data. It's a, it's a new process, essentially and we would want to judge going forward uh, based on this new process, of, uh, new, new uh, period of stability. So again, I get really excited when people say, ask me, should we calculate the limits? Because I know I'm reaching them. I know I'm, I'm getting my message across, and that's exactly what we should do. So to summarize lessons learned from the manual exercise, you know, until, until we saw that first signal, we were seeing only noise. And reacting to that noise, it's counterproductive, it's costly, it uh, drives up people's stress levels. They're chasing things when they really shouldn't be. 
And uh, likewise, missing that process shift is, is, a, is a tragic lost opportunity to learn something important. And um, the other lesson learned is that these calculated limits, the upper and lower limits, they're dynamic as our process changes. Hopefully it doesn't. Hopefully our, our, our limits stay the same from now until eternity. Um, but I've never seen a process that does that. Processes always, they always change over time. It's, uh, it's entropy. There's no, there's no getting around entropy. We have to be vigilant. We have to keep an eye on our processes. And we have to recalculate our limits um, based on, on some, some good basic logic. Right, so um, that's, the, that's, that's the manual IMR exercise. Uh, again, I found it to be extremely useful uh, with people of all ilk. Um, at the CEO of my full-time employer, I walked her through this and, um, and, and, and I got my point across and, and, and she, was, she, was, she, she got the message, she accepted what I was saying and she then started to look at things a little bit differently instead of asking for tabular data. Um, she now asks for charts, she likes to see uh, visualized data and she leaves the uh, IMR calculations up to folks like me. Um, but in reality, what I've done is I've helped my company, I've helped my boss, I've helped my boss's boss, uh, and, and I've improved the bottom line of our company. Mission accomplished. So um, I'm now going to talk about Minitab, and I'm going to switch over, and I'm just going to remind everybody about our manual results. We had uh, the upper expected limit for the moving range of 5.13, and then for the individual values upper and lower range of 8.75 and 16.93. So now the mission is to try to duplicate those values. I'll have to switch over uh, to Minitab, with, oh, sorry, with one important prerequisite. Um, Minitab unfortunately has a, a default that will, that will make their calculated limits different from the manually uh, calculated limits. <coughs> Excuse me. So, so you have to go into options. And I'll show you how to do that. <clears throat> and you have to change uh, the default. I'll switch over to Minitab, change the default. You go to Tools, Options, um, Individual Graphs. Oh, sorry, you know, Control Charts and Quality Tools. <clears throat> Excuse me. An Estimating Standard Deviation. And there it is. The default. When you first install a mini tab, um, it'll use the pooled standard deviation to calculate the limits. So you get a slightly different answer. So um, change it to R bar, and all will be well in the world. So here's our original data set. Um, the, the, the 12 points that we used for the manual calculations, remember n was 12, um, for, for the individual values. So to hopefully duplicate our results, Manually, you go under Control Charts, Individuals, IMR, and our continuous variable that we're interested in is, in fact, in this case, milligrams of byproduct. You can go to uh, the Scale button, and you can click on Stamp and enter the date AM, PM timestamps. It will show up on the horizontal axis, and uh, hit OK. Hopefully. Yep, there they are, 5.13, 8.57, and 16.93. So we're able to, to duplicate in Minitab exactly what we got manually. So uh, uh, lucky us. I'll now switch back here. Yeah, I'll go back to Minitab shortly um, when, when we talk about some of the pitfalls to avoid. Um, and then we'll talk about you know, when, when, when do you use the software and when do you use the manual method? Well, here, here's my opinion, and, and this, my opinion is, isn't applicable everywhere. Um, it, in the place where, where I work and some of the local companies that I've helped out, just because uh, I know some of the folks in local Whatcom County businesses, uh, my experience is, is to start with, with people who are unfamiliar with process behavior studies. Start with pencil and paper, all, always. Um, starting with software, I think, uh, is, is, is problematic. Because people don't understand where the, the calculated value is coming from. We, we push a button and things pop up and, and we, don't, we don't have that sort of visceral understanding of, of where the data 
where the calculated values uh, is coming from. So um, I've also had really good uh, luck, um, not only with my present employer, but some of the cable manufacturers I've worked for in the past, um, using pencil and paper IMR charts at workbenches. We don't have computers available. We don't have software licenses. You know, the, 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 the factory um, doesn't have doesn't have network cabling. So, so this method can be used not just to teach people, but also as as an actual manufacturing process engineering tool. Um, and there's there's nothing wrong with it as long as people know how to make the basic calculations and the back of the form steps them through that process. And um, again, my experience, my experience is to use software as a convenience, but to, to be aware of the pitfalls. And that's the section uh, that we'll talk about last. Now, um, I put in a special section here about annotating charts. And this is the one, this is the one that really, to me, is the, the real slam dunk of process behavior charts. That we really should be annotating our charts. And I'll show you in a second what I mean by annotation. And, and, and I'll answer the question, why? Why should we annotate our charts? The reason is because the process behavior chart just tells you that there's something going on. It does nothing more than that. It doesn't tell you what the problem is. It doesn't say, ah, oh, the guy's got the temperature set too high, uh, we've got the, the tension set wrong, or uh, something's going wrong with some bearings. None of that vital process engineering information is, is, is part of the statistical analysis, if you will. So by annotating down at the bottom, okay, got a blown up version chart here. It's just the very bottom of the chart. You make you make notations. Yeah, we had a backup operator from this time period to this time period. We had a power failure at this time, or we did some maintenance, or Charlie said he heard a funny noise. Write it down on the chart because later on, when you see a process shift, whatever it is that you have annotated here might give you a good clue as to what action to take, what actual action you have to take to understand why the process shifted. It's a good shift. You institutionalize it. If something has gone off the rails, if you have some assignable cause variation, a signal that's detrimental, you've got to find it and you've got to eliminate it. So this link between the uh, statistical realm, if you will, and the process and engineering realm, if you will, is, is nicely um, made by annotating uh, control charts. And if you want to see an absolutely brilliant uh, case study um, of exactly that, although you use XBAR R charts rather than IMR charts. So that it was a, actually a, a videotape made back in the 1980s. Now uh, you can get it on DVD. It shows about a case study about annotating control charts, actions taken, um, maintenance schedules tweaked, uh, absolutely superb voice in the process case study that makes that important link between statistics and, and process engineering. So uh, if anyone has uh, access to this DVD, it's, uh, it's worth using, it's worth viewing, and it's worth showing people after you've had them make some control charts uh, uh, manually. Okay, uh, again, coming down the home stretch, pitfalls to avoid um, from, uh, from personal, painful personal experience, shall we say. Auto-calculated limits can deceive. Um, Statware does a wonderful job, uh, but it cannot think for us. If we go through um, Minitab and use the entire data set, 20 points, to calculate our limits, um, you get different numbers. You don't get 5.13 and uh, 16.93, etc. You get different limits, and it'll start giving you false indications. If we use all the data, it'll show that point right there um, as being an out-of-control point. The, the problem here is, is you have really two processes. You've got the process behaving itself likewise here, and the process after it's changed behaving here. And you've mixed all of that together. So beware of Minitab default. It will automatically use all the data if you don't tell it otherwise. And, um, and, and, and I've been burned by that, by that mistake uh, more times than I care to remember. It took me three or four times before I finally learned my lesson. Um, but there you have it. And there's a way to... Um, tell Minitab, in this case, to use just the first 12 data points, which is what we did for the manual calculations. Um, so you go under Individual Moving Range Chart, hit the Options button, and go to the Estimate tab, and uh, you know, switch the, um, the pull-down list to use the following subgroups when estimating parameters. 
1 through 12, and we use the average moving range. And um, it will then duplicate um, the manual results, and it will also duplicate the, uh, the mini-tab results that, I, that we saw based on the first 12 data points. We get the correct uh, process uh, behavior chart limits. And sure enough, it, it shows that signal, that point there is not being a signal, random noise, and it starts showing all these signals if we elect to, um, to have Minitab analyze um, abnormalities and to, to do these various statistical tests for us. It shows, yeah, after this point, things have really changed. Again, it's because we calculated these limits based on this process uh, period of stability. So now we're voice of our process now coming through loud and clear through Minitab, so we can we can get to the same end game manually as, as, we, as we can with software. And again, uh, statware is great, but I think there's this uh, tendency to over rely on these automatic tests. You know, the uh, the red dots here and the, the numbers. Uh, sometimes it's good to turn turn off those those automatic tests and to, and to look at your data and see what it's telling you. Um, it's a, it's a bit of art. Um, I, I I've only been studying these things now for, for, for maybe four or five years. And, and I, 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 I can't tell everything, so sometimes I, I, I switch the automatic test back on. But most of the time I'll start with a, with a manual um, analysis and try to figure it out on my own. So uh, again, sometimes we tend to over-rely on software. And here, here's the 10 tests. You can, you can ask Minitab to do any or all of them or none of them. You go under individuals, moving range chart. Again, hit the options button and to the test tab where you can turn things off if you wish. Um, and then the other, the, the, the other pitfall worth mentioning is, is <clears throat> there's always a resistance to change. This is a human characteristic. People um, don't like to change. And, and sometimes when you, when you review these kind of methods with people, they, they, they don't push back. And they'll say, no, I, I'm comfortable with my tables of, of data and my rows and my columns and my Excel spreadsheet. But what I found is that by, by taking some data and visualizing it, and here's, here's some data where we've got the U.S. trade deficit and we have this limited comparison between April 2012 and April 2011. And so, so you put a chart like this, people will, will look at it and say, yeah, well, where's, where's everything in between? Well, that's the whole point. By, by making this, this chart, you, you demonstrate that there, there's something missing. In a tabular um, summary or in a newspaper article, that point doesn't come across. The missing data doesn't come across easily. Um, easily understood examples help. Uh, sports is a great one. Uh, there's always a plethora of sports statistics out there for us to look at. Uh, here's a famous one, and Donald Wheeler uses this one in his book, uh, about Roger Maris, uh, one time the holder of uh, most home runs in a season. And uh, John Kennedy invited Roger Maris to the White House and uh, baseball signings and all of this. When in reality, um, Roger Maris's 61 home runs in 1961 was in fact an anomaly. And his entire career, if you look at it with an IMR chart, was in fact rather mundane, nothing really special about it, just that one special data point. So you can get points across trying to separate signal from noise using sports uh, analogies or sports data. And, um, and then again, sometimes this, 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 this material is, is dry, so you always try to interject a little humor. And here's my lame attempt at humor, start of the Stanley Cup, so I thought it was appropriate that um, John Kennedy should have, should have invited Bobby Orr, because Bobby Orr um, was, in fact, uh, extraordinary uh, from beginning to the end of his career. So his, uh, his IMR chart would have looked outstanding and stable uh, for the 11 years that he played. So again, you try to interject a little bit of uh, data that people understand, maybe not related to your process. Try to try to make light of the subject. And, um, and references. There are some excellent references. And um, I'm fast running out of time here, so I'll uh, just uh, mention it very quickly. Uh, there's, there's an essay. It's called The Germ Theory of Management uh, by a fellow named Myron Tribus uh, that I have found to be a really, really excellent reference for those that are trying to come to grips with the whole idea of changing the way they look at data. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a great story, and anyone that hasn't read it, um, I would strongly recommend reading it and then using it uh, to, uh, to teach.
So uh, now to summarize everything, um, what, we're, what we tried to do during all of these exercises is to try to teach people a very simple lesson. Take off these self-inflicted blinders that we put on ourselves. Limited comparisons are all around us. Um, you, you never see graphical plots in the media, and, and when you do, they're usually so full of chart junk that you can't really interpret them. So teaching people a really simple, effective method to, to analyze data, um, I believe, is, is, is a worthwhile pursuit. And uh, using IMR charts to listen to your process. That's the, that's the whole point. This is what we're trying to do and to avoid the uh, two um, capital mistakes. Um, avoid chasing noise, chasing things that aren't there, tilting at windmills, if you will, and um, to avoid missing signals. So with that, um, I uh, would like to thank everybody and um, open things up for questions. So, Steve, I have a couple of questions here. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you very much for your presentation. It was very, uh, very good. And uh, I will pass these questions along to you. But if you'd like, we have uh, me and two other Master Black Belts online, uh, Larry Dyer and Peter Bursbach. So if uh, you'd like some help in answering some of these questions, let us know. And, and uh, okay. We'll do that for you. So the first question is from Ruth, and she says, I use these charts for patient falls, which can be credited to extrinsic and intrinsic factors. Is that an appropriate use? Patient falls, so uh, a, a count per day of, of, of a number of patients falling? Uh, stand by. Let me... Uh, Ruth, if you'd like, I can unmute you, and you can go ahead and uh, ask the question. So I've unmuted your microphone, Ruth. You are now live. Or you can type it in. So I think Ruth has gone shy on us. Um, okay, I would okay. guess it's uh, a count of falls. That a count, I, yeah. And I have seen these charts used. Um, yeah. So Ruth said yes. Okay. Um, yeah. The, assuming assuming that there's sort of equal opportunity for falls over periods of time, um, looking at the count data might make sense. Sure. Okay. So I agree, uh, Ruth, that this is a, a good chart. You can plot patient falls. The beauty of it is uh, of the X, well, X chart or IMR chart is that um, when in doubt, you can always use it. It's a good approximation of any other control chart. Uh, technically, the falls data would probably be uh, something you should put on a C chart or a U chart. And Minitab also has a, a variation of those charts called the Laney chart, L-A-N-E-Y. So that would be the exact tool, but this would be a very good approximation, and uh, it would also be something much easier to explain than one of, one of the more complicated charts. Um, one thing to chime in there, Tom, if I... Sure, go ahead. Just one, one other point that just comes to mind, if patient falls are extremely rare, um, Minitab also has a, it's a rare event chart, I think there's T and G charts that might might be useful. It, it depends on, you know, if, it, if it's a daily occurrence, then they're not the right chart to use, but there's, there's one other option as well. Okay. So we have a, uh, a comment and a question from Cecil. Uh, Cecil says, excellent presentation. Are there simi similar manual forms for X bar R charts to allow for a similar approach? Yes, absolutely. Um, there, there's been the uh, the famous um, control chart form that's been that's been uh, available to us now literally for decades. I, I remember them back in the early '90s. Uh, and there is an XMR version, uh, XBAR version as well. Yeah, you bet. I, I haven't created one in uh, in Excel yet, but uh, I'm, I'm working on it. So, Cecil, if you want to send me a, a, an email. Um, when I have it done, I'll, I'll send it to you. I'd be glad to, and uh, thanks very much for the uh, for the kind words. So, um, 
Steve, I don't know if we include your email address. Would you like me to uh, put it in the chat window for everyone? Yeah, sure. SteveCZ at Hotmail.com. Okay, so uh, in the online chat, we have, uh, we have Steve's um, email address. Tom, this is Peter. Peter, go. Pete's a master Pete, blacker, as many of you know, because he grades your homework assignments. <laughs> there's also the AIAG, Automotive Industry Action Group, has some online. I believe you can print out from that their website uh, control chart papers for the X bar and R chart. Okay, so you could probably Google AIAG uh, control chart form and, and find it that way. Yes. Uh, another question from Nicole. Excellent information. And uh, can we get a copy of today's presentation? Uh, yes, you will. The, the uh, webinar software in a day or two will automatically send you an email. You'll have a link to all the slides used in today's presentation. I'll also create a recording and uh, we'll uh, send you a link to um, a tool that I'm going to show you in a, in a minute before we log off uh, for creating these if you don't have many tab. Um, hey, Tom, can I, can I again make one comment? Certainly. Yeah, yeah, I would encourage everybody to take the actual data that, that, that we used. Um, again, it comes from one of Donald Wheeler's books, and and just simply change the units instead of talking about milligrams of byproduct. You know, have it uh, percent scrap or something that's relevant to your audience, and and just use the same data. That that message um, about the process shifting is beautifully shown by that ex exact data set. So uh, so um, the slides are available to everybody, and you can slice and dice the data and. Uh, and, and teach people using the same data, just, just paint it using different units, different context. Good idea. Uh, Guillermo asks, good day, thanks for the presentation. Can you elaborate more on the don't trace noise perspective? Yeah, yeah, um, you, you bet. The, 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 the tendency is for, is for people to, to try to assign meaning to every individual data point they see. So again, you, you hear comments like, ah, scrap is up since yesterday. Um, uh, revenues are down week on week or something like that. And, and if, if, you, if you plot the data and calculate the limits and show that the data is behaving itself, it's staying within the limits, there's no patterns, there's no unusual uh, increasing and decreasing of the data, then, in fact, those day-to-day -day changes or week-to-week -week changes are simply noise. They're simply expected random variation. And by interpreting it as a signal and chasing it, you, you're, 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 you're wasting your time most, most of the time. You're wasting, you're wasting effort and, uh, and money, and you're, you're, you're chasing after something that's just simply not there. So. So I say at the end, don't chase noise. It means, you know, until you see a clear signal from your your IMR chart or some other control chart, um, stand down, uh, wait to make sure that what you're seeing is really a signal. Okay, great. So we have several other folks that are saying thank you and uh, complimenting you on the presentation. Uh, I want to take the few minutes that we have left to show you a uh, a tool that I downloaded from the ASQ website. And this is a tool for creating uh, control charts using Microsoft Excel. And I assume it's publicly available because uh, there, there is no notice other than this about who created it and what it's to be used for. And I will include a link to this tool in the uh, follow-up email that you'll all receive. And basically, uh, this is a tool that lets you enter data. So I was entering data from uh, Steve's example. and in these cells, um, and what this particular uh, form does is it uh, lets you choose your sample size, and if you choose a sample of one, it plots an individual's chart and a moving range chart, and it puts lines at uh, one sigma, two sigma, and three sigma. Some people find that helpful, 
and it also, of course, plots the average and the uh, upper and lower control limits. Uh, the problem was that I didn't see a way to tell it that you wanted to um, base your control limits on a, on the first 12 groups, for example, and then plot the rest. So as you add points, it recalculates the control limits. Uh, there may be a way to stop it from doing that, but um, I couldn't find it in the brief time that I took to look at it. And uh, essentially it, it would be, as uh, Steve said, something you'd use after you taught people how to use the chart manually because this is a black box to most folks and they're not going to learn how to do this correctly from uh, the software as well as they will from doing it by hand. So I want to thank everyone for attending and uh, I want to thank Steve for a, a fantastic presentation and uh, my master black belts who were here to help. Uh, thank you all, and as I say, there'll be a, a recording that uh, we'll, you'll receive a link to, and um, I'll ask Steve if he'll let me put this up on YouTube, and the world can benefit from it. Uh, yeah, but yeah in absolutely. Respect, yeah, it's no, no problem, Tom, and uh, I just have to send you the final slides for distribution as well. I made some changes since the, the, um, the draft I sent you. Okay, very good, and, and thank you all for attending, and uh, we'll see you at the next webinar.